Bom dia a todos, sejam bem-vindos a mais uma edição do nosso ciclo de seminários eh, conjunto do Departamento de Ciências Atmosféricas e Climáticas da UFRN e também da pós-graduação em Ciências Climáticas. Um, vou falar inglês hoje, então a partir de agora vou falar inglês. Um, good morning to everybody. Um, we are here on a new edition of our uh, seminar cycle of the um, graduate program in climate sciences and our department in atmospheric and climate sciences of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Natal, Brazil. And today we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Michelle Flores from the Watson Institute of Science in Israel. And uh, well, welcome, Michelle, first of all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Yuri. It's an honor. Yes, it's an honor to have you here with us today. So, um, Michel, he's a research associate at the Weizmann Institute and also the group leader of the group of uh, ocean, ocean and atmosphere interactions. And uh, he will uh, present his work to us today. And, uh, well, I will make it short. I will pass the word to you, Michel. Okay, thank you. Buenos, buenos dias, buen dia to everyone. Hi. Uh, I don't know how many people there are. Are, are they going to be able to ask questions? I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, uh, I haven't never done this format before. So yes. I... Okay, so we have the format is a little bit different as we don't have this huge uh, Zoom license. We generally uh, have only the presenter uh, at a Zoom meeting and then people assist via the YouTube link. And okay. they can ask questions there, and I will pass the questions to you. Okay, great, great, yeah, because I, 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 I... or in Spanish, or in English, or in yes. German, or whatever, yes. then I pass okay. <laughs> Great, so um, just, um, okay, so just a little bit of background of myself. So I'm Mexican, um, was born in Mexico City, uh, grew up there, uh, then moved around. I did my first degrees in the U.S. and in France. Then I went back to UNAM to the, in uh, Mexico, and then I did a master's there in uh, cloud. Uh, I did my first degrees in physics and mathematics. Then I went to do a master's in cloud physics. I did it uh, with Daryl Baumgartner and Graciela Raga. Maybe you guys know them. Uh, I did it in a sub series. Then I moved to Germany to do a PhD in optics. Um, a, in aerosol optics, I'm sorry. And then uh, I was invited to do my postdoc in Israel about, uh, when was it? 10 years ago, something like this. And then when I finished my postdoc, I did it with Yinon Rudi here from the Weizmann. And I was ready to go back to Mexico to get a, um, to get a position actually in UNAM, but then uh, the professor, professor Ilan Cohen and professor, and which is a, he's a cloud uh, physicist and professor Asav Vardi, who's a microbiologist here from the Weizmann, they invited me to lead this group and this, uh, this collaboration project that they started back in 2011. And so, yeah, and now it's, uh, it's been five years, about five years since I've been in charge of this, uh, of this collaboration project. And uh, yeah, and today I'll be sharing with you the work that I've been doing in the past, uh, in, in this past time and our collaboration with uh, the uh, Taga Ocean Foundation. It's a French uh, foundation that I'll be telling you about during the talk. Um, yeah, and I think um, if, I don't know, uh, you did, you tell me if there's anything else I can go ahead and start or um yes you can you can yes. start so again welcome and amazing cv very international so you have been in a lot of places <laughs> yes that's quite interesting yes yeah, yeah yeah i've been moving a lot um okay so normally i i i don't mind at all questions during the talk so i i know that they, with this format is a little bit more difficult uh however please If anyone in the middle of the talk suddenly has some question that's something to understand, please send it to Judith and interrupt me. It's, uh, I like it that it's much more organic a conversation than me uh, just giving you a talk and, and stuff. So let's see, like, please, really, if you have a question, don't feel embarrassed to uh, send the question and tell Judith to interrupt me so I can try to answer your question. 
Um, people uh, over on YouTube on the chat that they can ask questions right yes. away. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry yes. for the format. This is what. We no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, I, we're adapting. It's fine. It's part of the pandemic. Uh, uh, it's, it's the way that we're working now, so it's okay. It's, it's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, within our group, we uh, we literally try to go from marine microbiology all the way up to clouds. Uh, so this is why I call from marine microbiology to clouds. And today I'll be the focus of the talk. It will be about a discovery we had in a previous expedition. But allow me first to um, give you a small representation of what is this, um, the interface that we're studying. So this is a small representation of the interconnections that happen in the interface between the ocean, uh, the atmosphere and the clouds. So in this interface, some of the most significant processes that are affecting the clouds, Earth's climate um, happen. So there's fluxes of energy, fluxes of momentum, gases, aerosols, which I'll focus today. Uh, happen all the time between the two media. Now, this exchanges process involved, they're, they're complex. It's complex interactions uh, between physical processes, biological elements um, of, this, uh, of this system. And because of these complex, complexities, the outcomes of, this, of the key processes are not, are not fully understood. There's many questions that we have. And this uh, lack of understanding, it limits our ability to actually represent them in, in our climate system and therefore in models and how we want to predict, for example, climate change, okay? So as I said, our main line of research is this interconnection between these different components. So you have on one side, what I call here the um, pelagic ecosystem. Um, and all of the different uh, microorganisms that live there. And I, will, and I will try to explain to you how it affects what is called the sea surface microlayer. This is the topmost layer of the ocean surface. Um, also the pelagic ecosystem affects the production of what is called sea spray aerosols. These are particles that we produce. I'll talk about them uh, just in a minute. And we wanna distinguish, for example, the process that affect the formation of the particles that are emitted directly in the ocean uh, surface to what is, for example, the ones that are being transported from uh, the continents, for example. And finally, but not least, we want to know how uh, the relationship with the sun uh, radiation and then how they affect the clouds. Okay, so I will talk briefly about each component and I will have a little bit of a larger emphasis on sea spray aerosol since it's, it's the main part of the talk. Okay, so the epipelagic zone, this is, uh, I'll talk first about the epipelagic zone. This is home to uh, phytoplankton. So the epipelagic zone is the upper part of the ocean and is the part of the ocean where there's enough sunlight for microorganisms. So for example, algae or bacteria to utilize the sunlight to convert carbon dioxide into foods and uh, do photosynthesis. Now, uh, phytoplankton, even though their biomass represents around 0.2% of the photo photosynthetic biomass. Sorry, uh, are, you yes. sharing, are you sharing already the slides? You cannot see it. You cannot see it? Huh? No, I thought you were still at the introduction, but people are... Ah, no, I'm... Uh, okay, I'm very sorry. I'll share. Okay. Yeah. So now, can every can yes? See. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. So the first two minutes, three minutes that I talked was actually this representation. Okay. So a real recap of what I just said. So these are basically the four components that we're studying: the pelagic ecosystem, where you have different microorganisms living, how they affect the production of uh, sea spray aerosols. So the particles that are directly uh, produced in the ocean surface, uh, how the pelagic ecosystem affects what it's called the sea surface microlayer. This is the topmost um, one millimeter, less than one millimeter of the ocean. And we also want to understand how all this connects to cloud formations because without um, aerosols, you cannot have clouds, okay? So I'll go now 
to the next slide. So this is the representation of the epipelagic zone. As I said, is the home of uh, to phytoplankton. And uh, as I mentioned, this is the part of the ocean where there's enough sunlight for uh, algae and bacteria to do photosynthesis, to convert carbon, uh, sunlight uh, to uh, carbon dioxide and food. And now the phytoplankton, they are um, a little bit, there are about 0.2% of the photosynthetic biomass on earth. However, they produce about 50% or a little bit over 50% of the oxygen that we have in our atmosphere. So you can think about it romantically that every second breath you take is thanks to phytoplankton. Okay. They're also the basis of the ocean's food web and they played a critical role in the cycling of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to the biosphere and back. Okay. Now, uh, sea spray aerosols, these are the liquid seawater drops that are generated at the ocean surface and they're the ones that connect the ocean, the atmosphere and the clouds. Now, why do we um, care so much about sea spray aerosols? On one, they're the largest component of, of aerosol mass over the oceans. Um, and um, they are the main source of light scattering over the oceans. So they affect the radiation balance of Earth. They serve as a good vector for trans um, between marine ecosystems. So they can transport microorganisms from different regions of the ocean. They are a good cloud condensation nuclei, CCN. So they have an influence on the initial size distribution of droplets in marine clouds and have a critical impact on the microphysical and macrophysical properties of marine clouds. Okay. Now, the, the known formation mechanisms of what we know until today, and actually I will be giving you some uh, uh, a discovery that we found that complicates a little bit more their formation mechanism. So up until today, it's been shown that they form when you have sustained winds over the ocean. So this creates waves, the waves then break and air goes into various depths of the ocean. This creates uh, bubbles. Now these bubbles will rise. Uh, so when you go to the ocean, you see white caps. So these are bubbles coming up. Now when they burst, they produce what is called film drops. You can see it in the red um, square and then they will also create what is called um, jet drops, okay? So, and then they'll inject it into the atmosphere, then the wind carries them away and they might, and sometimes they can reach um, cloud base. Now, due to the differences in film and jet, uh, jet drop production, so it is suggested that the film and jet drops have different compositions um, and they will be affected differently from the properties that are in the ocean surface. Okay, now there's another mechanism to create, uh, I'm sorry, and I wanted to say that recently was shown that it's about 43% of, uh, of the droplets that are produced are actually jet drops. Uh, one more mechanism that we have to producing is when in case of strong winds, you have uh, drops that are directly thrown off the wave crests, and this uh, creates what are called spoon drops. So I have a, this are a picture showing the spoon drops, you can see it here with a the botaga on the back, and you can also see the white caps uh, there. Okay. Now, uh, sea spray aerosols are influenced by properties of the seawater and any meteorological or environmental factor that affects the, uh, sur the surface properties of the ocean will affect them. Um, so, for example, like the sea surface temperature will change the viscosity of the water and therefore the rise speed of the bubbles. Uh, the biological activity, which controls the amount of surface active materials, will affect the bubble lifetime and the amount of sea spray aerosols that can be produced. Uh, salinity will affect the dissolved material in the water and therefore the composition of the sea spray aerosols. And last but not least, the sea surface microlayer, as I mentioned it before, which is referred as the skin of the ocean, um, can also affect it. Um, now, organic material in the microlayer, for example, um, has been shown to be able to nucleate and serve as ice nucleation uh, nuclei, okay? So now the sea surface microlayer, so the skin of the ocean, this is the uppermost one to 1,000 micrometers of the layer of the ocean. Uh, it's been shown to have distinct physical, chemical, and biological properties than the water below it, than the underlying water. So 
for example, it has elevated microbial and viral activity. Um, also, dissolved and particulate organic matter can be enriched up to 1,000 times compared to the, uh, the water below it. And one of the most important results is that it's been shown to be stable enough at the average wind speed above the oceans, which is about 6.6 .6 meters per second, which this suggests that it's ubiquitous uh, in our oceans. Uh, so, for example, the differences uh, between the sea surface microlayer and the underlying water are one of the reasons we expect differences between film drops and jet drops. Okay. Now, last, and to close the introduction, um, about the different components that I show you and that we're studying, I'm going to mention a few lines about the huge importance of clouds. Now, the image you see here is a composite uh, of cloud coverage for about 13 years. And as you can see, it's clear that our planet is actually quite white. So it's about 60% of the Earth's surface is normally covered by clouds. And over the ocean, there's only 10% that is cloud free compared to land that is about 30% of the skies, which are completely free. Now in the last IPCC report, uh, they emphasized um, that in order for us to understand climate change, we must understand clouds. And it's like in the, the error bars are the ones that are the greatest in, in, in clouds. So you can see clouds as metaphorically, you can see it as the iris of our climate, climate system. How much it will be open or closed, it will determine how much energy from the sun enters the climate system. So if we want to understand it, we, uh, the climate, if we want to understand the climate, I'm sorry, we must understand clouds and how uh, they are regulated uh, as the climate is changing. And for example, sea spray aerosols, given that the oceans cover 70, over 70% 70 of our Earth, uh, they're crucial for understanding the clouds. Okay, so some of the questions that we are trying to answer that we still don't fully understand, uh, that we're going to try to explore, you know, for example, how do physical production mechanisms influence the chemical composition of the different sizes of sea spray aerosols? Uh, we had some advancements in our uh, understanding of this, but we're far away from understanding. The image you see here is the different compositions of different sizes of aerosols. So you can see how at bigger sizes, you have more sea salt, at smaller sizes, you have more organic carbon uh, dominating. Uh, we also want to know what compounds in organic or, uh, or organic are transported to sea spray aerosols. So these figures you show here, is, uh, for examples of crystallized sea salt aerosols, that have identical energy per X-ray. So this gives us the elements that are present. And this one's we collected it uh, off the coast in the, um, in the Western Pacific Ocean, okay? So we also wanna know how our production mechanisms influenced by biological and chemical properties within the ocean surface. So in other words, what's the role of the ocean surface in determining the quantity and composition of sea spray aerosols? So here I just showed a, a work from Christensen and colleagues from the Meditabilde group in Denmark. They explored it in the laboratory and I'll talk about our findings in the field about this question. And now we also want to know what microbes are transported uh, as sea spray aerosol particles. How does microbial activity in the ocean surface affect sea spray formation and emissions and ultimately clouds? Uh, we began to explore this question but I won't show those results today. Finally, we want to know what are the links between the marine ecosystem states. So, for example, uh, one algae that is called Emiliana Huxley, uh, it's dynamics, how it changes, uh, what is its life uh, cycle, uh, what is the specific interaction with viruses and, and bacteria that is present. And we explored these questions before. I put two examples of two uh, publications we had. One, we showed that viruses can be emitted from the ocean surface, they can remain infectious, be deposited and kill healthy algae, for example. And then in the other one, we saw that as algae dies, the components of the algae that dies can be emitted into the atmosphere and serve as cloud condensation nuclei, for example. Okay, so I hope that with this introduction, this uh, illustration is clear now of the different components, of the main components that we're talking about. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'll be focusing specifically on sea spray uh, aerosols and what I believe it is a connection with biological activity. Okay. Now, one thing is, <coughs> excuse me, how are we studying these components? So we're part of uh, different field expeditions with the Taga um, Oceans Foundation. So the main results that I'll be talking about 
our uh, about the Taga Pacific expedition. And then giving our time, I will talk about some results about what is called a mesocosm experiment, which is uh, this part. We do laboratory experiments, we do remote sensing, but I won't be talking about that. And then at the end of the talk, I'll tell you a few words about the expedition that we're involved now, which also um, Brazilian researchers are involved. Okay. So who is Taga? For those of you who have never heard of uh, this boat. So Taga is a 36 meter long, 10 meter wide aluminum uh, sailboat. It's called a Schöner because it has two identical masts. The masts are 27 meters long. So the top of the mast is about 30 meters above the ocean surface. It was bought and donated by Agnes B. She is a French fashion designer that uh, decided that she cared a lot about the environment. So she donated this boat to serve as a platform for scientists. So now the boat is today managed by the Taga Ocean Foundation. And over the last uh, decades, they've been organizing scientific expeditions. Their uh, primary focus is to study and to understand the impact of climate change and the ecological crisis that are happening in our oceans. And they spend a lot of time trying to educate and inform the public about the environmental issues. So anytime that we're in an expedition, we will be uh, guiding uh, school uh, children that come in for the, to see the boat and we explain the science that we do, or the general public just comes and we organize visits to the boat and organize the science that we that we done. Now, Taga became famous in the oceanographic world after their Taga Oceans expedition in between 2009 and 2013 because they uh, got five articles uh, in science. Uh, so they had basically one issue in science to their uh, research. So you can only expect to, uh, you, to become famous after you do that in the scientific world. Okay. Now about the, the Taga Pacific expedition. So this is where we started collaborating with Taga. Now, the Taga Pacific Expedition was a two and a half year scientific expedition where we sampled continuously the open ocean. So the surface part of, uh, of the ocean. Uh, and we wanted to understand the biodiversity and the ocean surface properties around the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Now, the main objective of the Taga Pacific Expedition was to understand the evolution of coral reefs in the context of climate and demographic changes. Now, I don't take, I didn't became part of that specifically, but our group was invited to add the atmospheric components of the campaign. So this allowed us to, uh, to study the ocean atmosphere interface. Now on the map here, you, uh, you can see the, the map of the whole routes that we did. Uh, the color scheme that you see around is actually the aerosol concentration above 250 nanometers across the whole route. So this is part of the measurements we did and that thankfully we were able to publish. Okay, now getting into how we were doing our work. So how did we sample uh, on Taga? So we installed an aerosol inlet at the top of the mast. Only for the first month of the expedition, we had it halfway up, but then for the rest uh, of the campaign, we had it all the way at the top. And then... Michelle? Okay, so we're having, we're having some internet problems. A internet está com algum problema. O Michel aqui no Zoom está travado também. Eu acho que o YouTube também parou. É, vamos ver se a gente resolve por aqui. Israel, você está aqui? Sim, estou aqui. Ah, ok. É, foi a ah, conexão okay. dele mesmo que deu algum problema. É, e a El está falando aqui. Michel Computer Crash. É o computador do Michel que deu, uma, deu um problema. Então, a gente vai ter que esperar. Ok, El, we will wait. I hope that this computer comes back fast. So, I will tell people here via YouTube. Vou avisar o pessoal aqui no YouTube.
Ok. <coughs> a gente aparentemente está passando no YouTube, não é? Está continuando aí, isso, Israel? Acho que está, né? Sim, é. tá, está ao vivo okay. ainda. Então, gente, o, o computador do palestrante travou. Ele deve estar tentando voltar. Vamos esperar aqui um pouquinho. Já, já ele deve voltar. Ok, thanks, Yael, for keeping us updated. So, soon Michelle will be back. Talking. They see your face and in small oh, and the slides. And so the slides. Israel. See, I'm back. Almost <laughs> back, wait. Almost back. Okay, uh, so uh, we had an audience close to 40 and now it's down, so I hope they come back. But let's... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's it's very unfortunate. It. No, it happens. It's not, and you have one hour, so don't worry. You have... Okay. Hour until four to talk or it takes a bit longer it's not a problem we have two hours for the whole seminar yeah so. okay and um, tell me when i'm back and then i can continue and apologize yes, yes. for you're technological you're, you're, i'm you're, back you're, yes we are back. okay <laughs> all right talk. um oh, sorry the computer decided to crash literally in the middle i apologize uh i believe so that i was in the middle of the part explaining the, the system that we have on board so um, okay, so we installed an aerosol system on boards and we put an inlet at the top of the mast. Only, at the, only for the first month of the expedition is that this uh, inlet was halfway up the mast and the rest uh, all the way up 30 meters above sea, the sea surface. So what we do is we pull the aerosol from the top of the mast, we pull it down and then we have a set of instruments. We had a set of instruments below and here, uh, this is the type of instruments we had. So we uh, built, I, I built a homemade filter system. That is the one that you see in the picture. So we collect the aerosols into filters. We use three for DNA sequencing, which I won't be talking about. And then uh, the other one is for morphology, where we do, we study the shape, quantity, and the elemental composition of, the, of each particle that we collect. I'll show some of the results here. And then we also had, um, instrumentation for the size distribution and total concentration. So we had what it's uh, who, for the people that study aerosols and know this, an SMPS system. This tells you, this is for the smaller size particles. And then we had an optical particle counter for the bigger uh, size range from zero, uh, 250 nanometers and above. And the, I'll be focusing on the results of that instrument specifically. Okay. Now, within the, as I said, it, during the expedition, we also had um, did there we go. Um, we were also studying the ocean surface. So here I put some pictures of the type of instruments that we were using. Now, on the talk, I will only be using the uh, what is called the micro thermosalinograph. And then we also have an instrument to measure the particle absorption attenuation of the ocean particles, not in the atmosphere, the ones that are in the ocean surface, and one that gives us the backscattering properties of those uh, particles that are within the ocean surface. Okay, so I'll be talking a little bit about those results as well. Okay, so now let me get into the main part of the talk. So this is our discovery. Uh, so this is what we discovered during this expedition. And what I want you to see here is that you have a diurnal change of sea spray aerosol concentration. Okay, so let me, I wanna say in a way how we, uh, since the seminar is not, it's not, a, it's not the paper. So while I got the data, the first year of the data, I was trying to see, try to make sense of the data that we're getting. And I separated the data into different sizes. And as I told you, the wind is a main component in producing aerosols over the ocean. So I wanted to see that my data made sense. And as I was separating the, the data, I came around what the figure that you see here. Okay, so what, what, what are we seeing? So the x-axis is time, local time. We converted everything to local time. And then on the y-axis, you see the total counts of aerosols above 580 nanometers. This is, uh, we'll use this as a proxy. 
in order. What I want you to see is that you have, during nighttime, you have iris, aerosol concentration. Then six o'clock hits, you have the aerosol concentration going up. It fluctuates and then six o'clock in the afternoon, it comes down. And you have this behavior all across until you have rain. And then it, when rain is happening, you don't see it. Now during, in the boat, in the, in the campaign, we also were measuring the amount of radiation arriving to the boat surface. So I asked my colleagues for that data and I overlaid it in the, um, uh, wow, it, I can't believe the problems I'm having with the computer. The, um, it's crazy. I, I have no idea why this is happening. It's very frustrating. Michelle, do you want me to send you my send me your talk and I pass the slides? Um, what I'll do is I'll save us another name and take away half of the. Um, <sighs> a very heavy talk. Do you have animations and stuff in it? I don't have animations. I just have pictures. So. It's happening with the Zoom meetings. Yes, just with ours or in general? I had a seminar a year ago and something similar happens with the oh. Zoom meetings. So I will. This is very frustrating. Yeah, but we are not in a hurry. Just take your time. And then are you, do you see it again? Yes, we are seeing your, your okay. graph. Yes, with the uh, sea spray aerosol. Yes, okay. So this yellow uh, shading that you see now, this is the sunlight arriving to the boats. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can see very clearly that during daytime, you have more aerosols. During nighttime, you have less aerosols. Okay, so it's about 30 minutes after sunrise that the concentration started to go up and it's about 30 minutes after sunset that the concentration goes down. Okay, so we started to ex explore like what is, what is this happening? We, this is something that had never seen before. So we went and tried to simplify things and then we decided to calculate the ratio uh, of all the sizes that we were measuring with the instruments. Okay, so first I want you to see the map. This is the first year of, the, of all the measurements that we did at the top left and then below it what you have is on the left axis is the ratio from uh, daytime con uh, average concentration divided by the nighttime okay and then the darker colors are the small sizes of the instrument so the optical particle counter will give you different size ranges okay and then we separate it per size range okay so the darker size are the smaller ones from 250 nanometers and then the lighter colors are up to three microns, okay? And then the, within the different parts of the ocean. And what I want you to see, the main message from this figure is that it's basically ubiquitous around the oceans. You can see that the ratio is above one almost all across the whole, uh, the whole expedition that we, that we did. Now, if I uh, put this together and just grab different areas of the ocean, okay? So I separated into Atlantic, Caribbean, the whole the middle of the Pacific, around Japan, the leg that we did between Japan and Taiwan, and then later uh, Fiji and New Zealand. So you, what you can see is, you know, the, in the graph on the right, you have the ratio day to night, and then the different sizes of the instruments. So what I want you to see is that uh, in the Pacific Ocean, which is the cleanest part of the Pacific Ocean, is where you have the highest ratios happening. And then in the Fiji, New Zealand, and the Atlantic Ocean, which are the ones that uh, dominated more from continental transport. So it's been shown before the Atlantic Ocean is quote polluted in the sense that you have a lot of transport from the uh, Saharan desert over uh, the Atlantic Ocean. In Brazil, you know, it's probably Natal, you know that sometimes you get all the plume coming from mineral dust from the, from the Sahara. So in general, it's much more polluted polluted uh, 
higher aerosol concentrations are present in the Atlantic Ocean. And you see that the ratios are smaller. So this suggests, and I'll explain to you in a second, that long range transfer plays also a role in masking the cycle. Okay. So since we saw these differences, we wanted to see if we can actually pinpoint if the areas that had more influence from continental transport had an effect on the, on the ratio. Okay. So now I added on the left side the total concentration of aerosols above 250 nanometers. Okay. And I added it with the colors that you see in the map. So you can try to relate the different areas between the total concentration and the map. And what I want you to, uh, to see is that, for example, the, the Atlantic Ocean and then around Japan and New Zealand is where you have the highest aerosol concentration. Okay, so this was the first indication that we had. And then what we decided to do is to plot the ratio of day to night concentration for uh, total concentration above 580. We use that as a proxy as a function of the total aerosol concentration, okay, for different wind speeds to see if we can distinguish between the local production that, that we see that is, will be caused from the wind speed and the long range transport. So this is what you see on the right side. Okay, now you have for all the data in the uh, upper corner and two uh, main things. What you see is that the wind speed doesn't seem to be playing a factor. We don't see any, anything distinguishing when we, uh, see the different wind, wind speed regimes. But then what you also see is that as the aerosol concentration increases, you see that the ratio tends to one, okay? So this tells us that the, as you're closer to continental areas, or if there's uh, some influence from continental areas, this long range transport will mask the diocycle. The, the diocycle will be present, but will be masked. So this might be one of the reasons why no one had seen it before. Okay. Now on the other side, in the you can see in the clean area that we cannot, which is only the Pacific Ocean, that the wind speed cannot really distinguish the different uh, ratios. Okay. All right. So now let me go in into that. We wanted to make sure that the origin was marine, and we wanted to understand what is the composition of the particles that we're measuring. So what is what is really what type of particles we're measuring? So I bring you back to this image that I showed you at the beginning. Okay, where you see the uh, aerosol count and you see the, uh, the, the sunlight arriving to the boats. Okay, so the first thing that we did is we did uh, analysis of 48 hour back trajectory analysis. So where are the air masses coming from before we sample them? Okay, and these are the black lines that you see on the map. Okay, the circles that you see are the ratio for specific days. Okay, and then the this area that I've been showing uh, all along, so now so that you have a reference, where is it physically? It is actually this area of the Pacific Ocean that I'm showing, okay? Now, the 48 hour back trajectory, so these black lines that you see here, so the vast majority of them are coming from the middle of the ocean, okay? So this, uh, it's telling us that in our case, like the, this takes away the, the influence from the continents because it's at least 48 hours, that the air mass before we sample it was over the ocean, okay? And specifically this case that I'm showing here, if I would have drawn the five days and even 10 days back trajectories, you will see that all of them are coming from the middle of the, of the Pacific Ocean. So they had not uh, gone over any continental uh, uh, regions for over 10 days, okay? So that's one part. Now, um, to study the composition of them, we took the filters that I told you. So these filters, it was a bulk collection. So we collected for 12 hours during the day and 12 hours during the nights. This is what we're collecting. And then we put them through the scanning electron microscope and with an energy dispersed X-ray analysis. What does this do? The X-ray analysis, it tells you what elements are present in each particle that we're measuring. So I put this uh, example with the picture and the spectra on the side, okay? And now once we have the elements that are present, we used a scheme already published by Laskin et al. 2012 to just differentiate the different uh, composition of the aerosols. So if, for example, so the, our definitions are if the sodium concentration is greater than all of the elements except 
chloride, of course, then we called that this particle was sea salt. If there was sodium present, but it, the concentration was less than other elements, we call it, it was a metal with uh, sea salt. Uh, then we have sulfate with sea salt. So the sodium concentration is greater than all other metals, except that uh, sulfate, which is less. And we also have sulfate aerosols that there was no sodium present and only sulfates was present there. And if none of those uh, definitions fit, we just called it other. So we analyzed over 12,000 particles for around the same size range of the instrument that uh, and the optical particle counter. And in 14 daytime filters that we analyzed, we counted over 6,900 particles, where in contrast, in 15 nighttime filters, we only counted fi about 5,894. So using a completely different measurement, we have an indication that the dial cycle is already present. Okay, because the, the filter collection has nothing to do in a way with the uh, optical particle counter. They both came from 30 meters above, but it was two different inlets, two different instruments completely. Okay, so this is supporting the results that we found. And then when we did the uh, analysis, we found that the vast majority of the particles are, are, are sea salts. So this just reaffirms that the particles that we're measuring having the dial cycle are from uh, marine origin. Okay. Okay. Now, let me remind you what is so. Now that we know that it's from marine origin, so we wanted to go like, okay, so what is the mechanism causing this? What is what's happening? How is it that you have that the ocean is producing? We think more particles during the that we have more particles during the day and the and the atmosphere of the ocean than at night. Okay. So what affects the production of the aerosols, what the growth, the transport and the removal, I put the different components. We have the atmospheric processes and we have the ocean processes. So we started to explore these. So we started with the wind speed because it's one of the main mechanisms of production. And here, what we did is, again, we took the concentration of aerosols above uh, 580 nanometers, the total concentration, and we bend it at different wind speeds for nighttime and for daytime. If to try to, um, so what we're seeing is that for the same wind speeds, you have completely, you have different concentrations and you have different slopes of this curve. This tells us that the wind speed is not the one responsible for the dial cycle uh, mechanism. It tells us that it plays a role in its production because as the wind speed becomes larger, you have more aerosols produced, but you have a difference between daytime and nighttime. So the wind speed can not fully explain uh, the dial cycle that we see. Mm -hmm. Now, then we started to see atmospheric stability. So we changed, we studied the, um, uh, we, we studied the, the changes in height of the atmospheric marine boundary layer. We used the ERA-5 reanalysis data. So this is the blue curve that you see. Um, so, and we also can observe that the, this, the changes in the atmospheric marine boundary layer cannot fully explain the dial cycle. Why? Because if the height variations uh, within the marine boundary layer were driving the dial pattern, given, of course, that there's no changes in production between day and nighttime, the diurnal concentrations of aerosols uh, should follow those seen by the marine boundary layer. And it's not what we see here. Um, also, the changes that we see in the height of the marine boundary layer are about 40 meters when the marine boundary layer height is about 3,800 meters. So it's less than 1%. And it's much less than the changes that we see in total concentration. So we cannot exclude that there's a possible inference in the changes in the height of the marine boundary layer, but it's very unlikely that the changes in stability or changes in the height of the atmospheric marine boundary layer are driving the dial cycle. Now we studied the relative uh, humidity and temperature that we were measuring uh, on the uh, on the boat. So, Michelle, if sorry. I have a question, you said yes, you, we could ask questions. Can yes, of course. Thank you. One slide, please. Yes. Okay, so you have this uh, dial cycle for ten days, right? Or for eleven. This days. is just yeah. This is an example of ten days. 
Yes, but you have uh, you have more days where you. How many yeah. days did you did you look at the relationship? It's of- about two hundred and forty something days. Okay. Uh, that's yes sure so i have i don't know here it looks i don't know how the rest of the data looks but from here it seems that in many cases you have a reduction of the boundary layer height right after the minimum of the um, of the aerosol can't there be some sort of offset? which day no it starts well on the not on the well on the first day on the not on the second then on the well the days i will say the number of the days here okay so it's in in four uh and then seven eight nine ten but the, uh so the, so this this area if i point it out with the yes, pointer right after the uh, uh yes exactly so in the next one day eight for example here Yes, it seems that, that there may be some correlation. Um, so maybe in this, I, I, I agree with you that for this specific day, uh, you can have it. Now, the change in height here uh-huh. is about 30 meters. Uh-huh. So, uh, so you have an increase in 30 meters. You have a, a change of about 1%. Yeah. So the, the concentration of aerosols is about... Uh, 500 per cubic centimeter. So a 1% change, it will be yeah. five. So this is why we discarded it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was just yeah. looking it, we, at So, that. but I do want to emphasize, it doesn't mean that there's no influence. Uh-huh. I'm, just, I'm just saying that it doesn't drive the dial cycle. There's, there, yeah. To yeah. have those changes, there has to be something. something but else. it will have an influence, yes. Right, okay, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. All right, uh, relative humidity and temperature, of course. So if relative humidity and the air temperature were the main drivers of the dial cycle, um, you know, they will affect uh, the bubbles and the droplet evaporation, for example, or the sizes of the sea spray aerosols. So if they were the main drivers, we expect to see a clear relationship between the day to night uh, ratio of the aerosols and the mean day to night differences in air and relative humidity in air temperature. So you see here on the left axis is always going to be the day to night time uh, ratio. And on the X, you see the day mean and nighttime mean differences. And it's, you can see that there's zero relationship between them. So it's, it's a flat line. Uh, and it's about, and it's 294 days that were analyzed in this specific case. Okay. Now, rainfall, as I showed before, the rainfall actually suppressed the dial cycle, so it's not the main de- mechanism. So now we're left with the ocean surface. So we went ahead and um, did the, st- the analysis for salinity, sea surface temperature, and chlorophyll. Um, and as you see here, same as with the relative humidity and air temperature. The, relationships are basically none. And we have uh, negative uh, differences in the daytime mean of all the physical properties and positive. So they don't, um, they're not explaining it. They cannot explain that the, the, the differences that we see between daytime and nighttime of the sea spray aerosol concentration. Okay, so the main result in the, which is very big for us is that one, that we found the dial cycle, and two, that all these properties that were the, they're the main properties that had been explored until now cannot explain the dial cycle. So this is, if there's a take home message from this talk is this, okay? So uh, from this point on, what we try to do is to try to explain it, but we don't have a nail on the coffin of what is the explanation of the dial cycle. I will give you what we believe is the closest explanation of what is driving the dial cycle, but we're still in the process of really proving that what I will tell you is is the process, okay? So this is what I came into now, this is the main uh, message that I I, I would like for you to take home. There's a dial cycle and none of the usual suspects that everyone has been studying until now that control the production of CISPRESO can explain it. So we have a new formation mechanism, okay? 
Okay, so one of the things that we did find that the ocean surface um, affects is that we took the mean temperature of the sea surface, the, the mean sea surface temperature, so the, the average during the whole day, and we saw it against the ratio, and we see a positive relationship, okay? So this suggests that the sea surface temperature, as I said, is not controlling the cycle, but it does play a role in modulating the intensity of the day to nighttime ratio. Okay, now we're, I was happy to see these results because a recent publication showed that sea surface temperature actually modu uh, modulates the production of sea, uh, sea spray aerosol concentration. So we're consistent with what other persons, uh, other researchers saw. Okay, so now let me take you to the ocean surface. So we try to try to understand. Okay, so let's try, let's take the measurements from our colleagues that were studying the ocean surface and see if we can see a relationship, okay? So um, what I want you now to see in the bottom panel, so you already saw the panel of the concentration of the, of the um, composition of the sea spray aerosols. So you know these two panels and I added below what is called the ocean uh, particle size index. This is the size of the particles in the ocean, not the aerosols in the air, okay? So it's called gamma. Okay, and gamma, for those of you uh, studying aerosols, is the equivalent of the angstrom exponent of the atmosphere. Okay, so variability in gamma, uh, it indicates changes, I'm sorry, in the mean median particle size, okay, between 220 nanometers and 20 microns. So what do I want you to understand is that the smaller the gamma, it means that the larger the mean particle size of the, of, the, uh, of the particles in the ocean. Okay, so there's an inverse relationship. I inverted the axis here so that whenever you see the gamma quotes going up, it means that the size of the particles in the ocean are going up. Okay, so what you can see in the figure is that there's a congruency between the aerosol concentration uh, of the daily cycle and the changes in size in gamma. Okay, so when gamma reaches a, a maximum value, that is a minimum mean diameter, it's right after sunrise when the sea spray aerosol concentration begins to increase. And a minimum value, so gamma reaches a minimum value, that is a maximum mean diameter before sunset when the sea surface aerosol concentration decreases. Okay, so I summarize this in the next figure. Okay, now in this figure, to try to make it easier, what we did is we calculated the rate of change of gamma. Okay, so what does this mean? The rate of change of gamma means that if you have a negative rate of change of gamma, it means that the, there's an increase in particle mean size. And you have a, uh, if, the partic if, gamma, if the rate of change of gamma is greater than zero, you have a decrease in the mean particle size. So this is what you see in panel, uh, in, the, in the lower panel. So what I want you to see is that there's, there's a great congruency between uh, the rate of change between gamma and the amount of aerosol. So when the rate of change is less than zero, again, the y-axis is inverted, is when we have more aerosols present. And when the rate of change is below, uh, it's positive, I'm sorry, is when we have less particle concentration, okay? Now we try to understand what is driving the rate of change of gamma because it is something that is not known. For me, it was new because I'm not an oceanographer, but it's something that is not new in, in the oceanographic world. And we went ahead and we started what is called the backscattering uh, ratio of the total particle, uh, of, of the um, smaller particle to the total particle. Okay, so the backscattering is, it will be more sensitive to smaller particles. Okay, now in Previous publications has shown that for gamma values above 0.8, the changes in the backscattering ratio are related to the particle size. So when we have the back particle ratio uh, going at the same time as the, the gamma changes, uh, it, this tells us that the changes in sizes are coming from particles that are below one micrometer in size, okay? Now we went into literature and we found out that the changes in one micrometer size are related to 
uh, phytoplankton growth and division, okay? And this is something that, as I said, this is not new in the oceanographic world. It's something that we just basically showed as other people's, other researchers have shown. So the changes that we're seeing are related to when the phytoplankton are growing during the day and then dividing during the night or dying, okay? And this is basically the same dio cycles that was shown in a, in a different publication by, uh, I can never say his name, Ruwatz, okay? Now, let me take you to our results. We saw the greatest ratios of um, sea spray aerosols in what is called the oligotrophic uh, regions of the world. So with chlorophyll concentrations that are very low. So this is what you can see in the lower panel. Here, this chlorophyll concentrations are coincide with the highest ratios. And this area of the ocean, which is in basically the main part of the Pacific Ocean, these are called oligotrophic regions and are typically dominated by cyanobacteria, okay? So putting all these components together, okay? So what do I mean? So as I explained, neither atmospheric nor oceanic physical process can explain the dio cycle. Now we need to have a cyclical change that alters the dynamics of bubble bursting. As I explained, bubble bursting is the main driver of the production of cis aerosol. So it has to be a cyclical uh, change while the bubbles are bursting, okay? We saw that it, it occurs in non-productive ocean, open ocean waters, okay? And we found that the, uh, the parallel deal patterns in the particle sizes detected in the near surface can be attributed to variations in the size of the particles that are smaller to one micrometer, okay? And as I explained to you, during photosynthesis, this bacteria, the photosynthetic bacteria, um, they are uh, doing photosynthesis, and while they doing photosynthesis, they secrete stuff. To, I won't go into the detail of what stuff. Actually, I talk with biologists, and they don't even know exactly what is that stuff. However, a recent study showed that the secretions of bacteria alter the way bubbles are bursting. So this is a, a picture from uh, the publication of Poulain and uh, Boruba in, back in 2018. And what you can see here is a bubble that has nothing in it and it burst in four seconds. And on the right, you see a bubble that took 55 seconds to burst and it has the secretions of the bacteria. And if you go into their paper, they will see that they conclude that the presence of the, of the secretions of the bacteria produce much more droplets as they're exposed. So while we don't have the nail on the coffin, from everything that we have now, we're proposing that this is the mechanism. And we're hoping that either we will find a mechanism and either, we'll, either someone else will prove us right or someone else will prove us wrong. This is something that we're, just, we're proposing from, the, from our finding, okay? So let me summarize uh, what I just talked about. So this is the first observation of dial concentration changes of sea spray aerosols. This is the first time that this has been seen in our oceans. Um, it, is, it was, Observe in the Atlantic, we saw observe it in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Caribbean Sea, and in basically all the tropical latitudes of the Pacific Ocean. And as I show you, the presence of dominating continental aerosol transport can mask the dio cycle. So it seems that the dio cycle is present. Um, but if there's dominating of uh, long range transport, it can be masked. And I won't go in, into it today due to all the technical difficulties that we had, but we also observe it in a completely different setup. So we actually observe the Dao cycle in a completely different setup as well. And what mechanism wise, so the main message is that we showed that the main physical um, properties of the ocean and the atmosphere cannot explain it. We did see that the daily mean surface temperature positively correlates with the magnitudes of the day to nighttime ratio. So there's the influence there. And we're proposing, we still need to prove it, that bacteria might be the cause, okay? So let me now um, skip the part of the mesocosm due to time. Okay, I, it's, it's unfortunate, but this is what happens. Uh, for those of you that are interested, this is a set of, uh, publications that we're able to have. So you can go and uh, you can ask me for them if you're interested in the work that we're doing. And as I mentioned at the beginning um, of the talk, the mission that we're involved now is called Mission Microbiome. So on the left, you have the map uh, that we're going to be 
uh, going. And then in this mission, uh, we are going to sample the sea surface micro layer that we didn't do uh, before. And we are continuing our aerosol sampling uh, throughout. And this mission microbiome is part of a bigger expedition. It's called Atlanteco. And this is many researchers and Brazil is involved. So the, uh, the Veleiro Eco, which is uh, was done by the professor Andrea Santoros, Santa Rosa Freire from the University of Santa Catarina. So she was the one that drove and she built this mini Taga. And the mini Taga is doing measurements. Now, a, a joint Taga in uh, Sao Paulo, if I'm not mistaken, they were, both of the boats were together there. Okay. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I apologize for all the technical um, difficulties that we had today. And please, like any, I'm uh, more than happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Thank you very, very much, Michelle. Uh, well, the technical uh, issues in the end, they were minor. So, um, we, we solved it very fast. You solved it fast, so it's not a, not a problem. Don't worry about it. It was a really brilliant talk. Very, very interesting and a bit uh, different from what we uh, normally have uh, uh, here at, in our seminar cycle. So it was really exciting to get a, a view of the pure ocean <laughs> and, uh, and what aerosols do there. So um, we have a, a, a quite a few questions. So throughout your talk, I'm uh, happy to tell you that on the live yes. YouTube talk, we had always between 30 to 40 people, assist, Great. which is a good number. And usually it still rises a lot later because it will be online in our YouTube channel of the, of, of the university. So it can still be watched later. And uh, so usually the numbers still go up. And uh, we have a few questions that people posted here. Um, yes. In, uh, but I, I uh, will make a question first. <laughs> I have a number of questions, but I will ask one first one now, and then I will go over to the uh, YouTube questions. So um, I was uh, thinking, Misha, what about, uh, I mean, the, the explanation is amazing, the hypothesis with the, just the smaller droplets being built by the bubble bursting. Um, but may there also be an influence with the conversion to secondary organic aerosol maybe? Um, yeah. So we thought about it, but the thing yes. is that the secondary organic uh, aerosols are much smaller in size. So it, secondary production is around 30 nanometers, 40 nanometers, and their growth rates are about five, six nanometer per hour. Oh. So it's, we, we saw the time frames and it just, it, it cannot, it, it cannot explain it. One from the big size, because I show you basically these are considered big size in aerosol, in the aerosol sciences. Um, also the part that we showed that the aerosols that we're measuring are actually uh, coming from their sea, their sea salt particles. Yeah, right. So. Yeah. Yeah, so the growth of a sea salt particle at six nanometer per hour cannot, it doesn't explain that increase. Right. Yeah, right. yeah it was just a thought that came up. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's really like for us, it took us about two years to come out and be comfortable to say, okay, this is our finding. And, and we, it took us a long time to try to understand because it was, we discovered it. We didn't. We didn't go into the expedition looking for these results. Yes. This is the. Yes. This was the fascinating part for us. Yes. So it is. It is really fascinating. Very nice to make the link with the uh, algae. So um, I will go over to some questions. I still have a few, but I don't want to be selfish. So I will ask a question of my yeah, yeah. because I'm a bit privileged here directly in Zoom. <laughs> Yes. So um, I have a first question here from a student of our program. He's asking about, uh, he says here, the sea spray transfers to atmosphere droplets with dissolved marine aerosol or, or to dry aerosols. In case of dissolved aerosols, how 
do they become a CCN? Say that again. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to miss myself. Wait, uh, I think he's asking if um, when we have a conversion of the sea spray to atmospheric dro droplets or to aerosols, will they yes. be, uh, will the marine aerosol be dissolved in droplets or do you have dry particles? Ah, okay. So this will depend on the relative humidity of the atmosphere. So mm -hmm. When the droplets are emitted from the ocean, they're emitted as liquids, literally. So they're droplets coming from a bubble. They're uh -huh. liquid. And they will basically take a few seconds, no more, to equilibrate with the relative humidity from the uh, atmospheric marine boundary layer. Uh -huh. um, so it, in general, of course, it varies. But in general, it's about 80% relative humidity. So it's quite high. In the oceans, the relative humidity is not low. So they won't change too much in size. And when you go to CCN studies, uh, there's, a, a, there's a publication that is, uh, they call it, uh, size is more important than chemistry. And so basically, anything above 100 nanometers in size can serve as a good cloud condensation nuclei the chemistry becomes less important. When you go to the smaller sizes, the 50, 60, 30 nanometer size, this is where the chemistry uh, in the, in the, uh, will have a greater effects, uh, whether they're CCN or not. Okay. Great, thanks. I hope it answered. Yes, yes, I think that was exactly what you wanted to, to understand. So we have a question here by our colleague Pedro Mucci. He's asking or saying, Michelle, firstly, great science you're doing and great presentation. Could you further elaborate on the potential impacts or relationship between climate change and sea surface aerosols? So we have yeah. a very broad audience, so not everyone is an aerosol specialist. Yes, of course. Okay, of course, of course. So, okay, so one of the main reasons we're studying sea spray aerosols is because to be able to accurately model what uh, human-induced climate change, we need to understand the pre-industrial atmosphere. So to be able to understand the pre-industrial atmosphere, which was dominated by sea spray aerosols and mineral dust, so we need to understand what are their formation mechanisms. Because what happens is that you cannot have clouds if you don't have aerosols. The amount of aerosols will affect how a cloud uh, will grow if it rain, if it will not rain. For example, we've seen studies, uh, the Tumi effect, if you have more aerosols and you have the same amount of relative humidity, uh, humidity available, water available, I'm sorry, then the droplets, the aerosols that will form into droplets will not grow as much. And then the lifetime of, for example, of a cloud can increase. And many of them will not precipitate. Okay, so we want to go back in time quotes, of course, to try to understand what are the basic mechanisms that we have on our planet of this of aerosols in this case, so that we can put that as an initial, uh, initial conditions in our climate models to be able to more accurately predict once you put a perturbation, in this case us, with the, with the aerosols that we produce by burning uh, fossil fuels, so, or when we drive, when we produce energy from the energy plants, when we not naturally burn uh, forests, um, when you have um, deforestation, when you change the uh, lands, all these processes that are not occurring naturally, there will be a perturbation to what we can consider to be natural. So, and, and then if we understand our pre-industrial conditions, then we're most likely able to understand how we can per how we perturb that system and and predict it better for the future. I hope it was it was clear. Yes, I'm sure it was, Michelle. Great. So, and oh, our coordinator of the graduate program, Weber Gonzalez, he also has a question. He's asking the daily cycle clearly shows a maximum SSA during the day and a minimum at night. 
However, it seems that some days present two peaks. Could you give us yes. more details about this result? I'm very happy that someone that someone noticed it. We also okay. noticed it. Um, we explored it and we cannot explain it. Um, the hypothesis we have is that if we are correct that it is um, caused by microorganisms, in this case, bacteria. Um, I talked with some biological one, colleagues that study bacteria in the ocean, and they told me that in most in many occasions, excuse me, um, some bacteria don't like too much sun, and they will tend to go away from it. So uh, most of the these double peaks that that uh, this person, I'm very happy that they noticed, Way better. are happening. <laughs> They happen in the middle of the day. Now, we, as we were exploring the data, we didn't, we didn't have enough statistics to be able to, to say anything about it that could, it would, be, it would have been complete speculation. So we, we're leaving it as an open question and, and we're, uh, we're trying to find out the answer. But, uh, but yes, definitely, there's several occasions that you have this double peak. Um, so... And that's that's the only explanation that we can come up. That's it's too much uh, sun. So this something happens within the bacteria within the ocean surface that they say, oh, oh, not too much sun for me. And then they go up, and then that changes the production mechanisms. So when you say they go away, they basically go some meters further down under the surface. The thing is that you don't even need to go oh. a few meters because we, we believe that this is happening at the sea surface micro layer. So you, you can just go down a few centimeters and, and bacteria do have, it's fascinating, they have regulating mechanisms for them to sink or to go up oh, okay. um, it, uh, by themselves. It's, I had no idea of this, I'm, I'm learning because with this discovery, I, wanted, I went much more into biology mm -hmm. and I found out that, yeah, that, uh, there's many bacteria that have uh, buoyancy regulators and they change something within their organisms and then they can sink or they can go up well, mm -hmm. and you need only you need to go down a few centimeters the sea surface micro layer is less than a millimeter thick so you don't need to transfer <laughs> to travel a lot to change the way the bubbles are bursting yeah that's a, that's a explanation that makes sense so mm -hmm. they 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 are up there, they go up and then it gets dark and hot and then they go further down and then when it gets a bit cooler, they come up again and then you have to die. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting how everything related to climate science is how interdisciplinary it can get, right? <laughs> yes. Always learn something new. So the next question by a former colleague, Edicle Fernandes, who's now in Portugal. He uh, asked, nice. yes, he's a researcher at the University of Évora now in the Portugal since very recently. He was a PhD student in my group, actually. So he asks, with the increase of sea salt emissions in the tropical marine boundary layer, is it possible to have a cooling in the climate system? Ah, um, is it possible? So I don't know if it's, it's so. What I was thinking related to this is that, and this is me speculating just from, so I, I don't, this is not a scientific result. This is me moving forward and trying to get ideas. And, so if it's true that bacteria are the cause, to me, the fascinating thing is that if, so they affect directly the production. And then basically they say during the day, I need, when they produce more particles and the particles will then uh, interact with the sunlight and a little bit less sunlight will reach the surface. So whether it's cooling, I'm not sure because if it's a natural, if this being a natural a production mechanism it goes there's no to, i mean of course let, i'm sorry let me rephrase of course scattering of lights from aerosols or from clouds will have a cooling effect you have less energy arriving to the surface of the um of of the ocean but if it's a natural phenomena then it's it's not related to whether we have more cooling or not it's i think it will be more related to what is the 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 what the organism reacting to something that 
they might not like too much, which is not too much sunlight, more than a cooling than than a cooling effect. If if it makes sense, what I'm what I'm trying to say. Yes, please tell me because if, if I'm not explaining it correctly, I can rephrase. I think it makes sense as a, if I understand it right, because you mean. Okay, there are natural aerosols, and they have been there all along, and uh, they will not make make uh, additional greenhouse effect happen. Or another, uh, not so, not not greenhouse effect. That was wrong. But the, the cooling effect, the radiative negative radiative forcing. Yeah. They're direct. They're they're direct, they're, they're direct of, effect. Then, yes. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so if we had an uh, anthropogenic driver of these uh, aerosols appearing, then it would be different, but as it's not the case, yes. like, it doesn't change anything in the natural equilibrium. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so uh, great. Um, I also have a question uh, still about, um, I saw that you did measurements also close to the South American coast on the, on the Western side, and uh, you showed some trajectories in one of the maps um, that came from the Southeast. So is it possible that in these measurements, maybe you have some uh, continental uh, influence of the aerosols maybe from yes the um, so there's parts of there's of course parts of the measurements that we have that we have continental influence yes um but what we saw is that on one side when we have a lot of continental influence we see the ratio being decreased because uh it just gets mixed and then you uh it, there's a mask happening so uh it just goes into the noise of the data instead of being the signal and uh, another part is that I didn't focus on it, but then the, when we saw continental influence, we saw we saw it in the chemical signal of the elemental analysis that we did. So we uh, saw a reduction in chlorine. Now, reduction in chlorine in the particles means that there was some sort of interaction with uh, uh, anthropogenic pollutants, gas phase pollutants in the atmosphere. But we saw the cycle happening with those pollutants happening and without the pollutants happening. Oh, so okay. this tells us that it cannot then be Us, yeah. the uh, the anthropogenic influence. Because uh -huh. if, if not, it would have disappeared immediately when we don't see the pollutants. Anymore. Yes, right. And yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And one, another question about uh, that's more general. So, um, I, are you, I think there is some study I saw, I think you involved it too, about microplastics that are being found in the marine aerosols. So is so, this also part of the study or have you been studying that? It's yeah, yeah, we, we have a, we have one issue. So we have yeah. one publication We we again, like this, uh, this expedition brought us to places that we didn't think, but um, we found microplastic particles in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and we were able to show that they were not coming from the boat. It was quite a nightmare to show that, but we were able to show. Um, and then we also found that they were similar in composition with the plastic particles we found at the surface waters that we measured. So, coast? excuse me? Close to the coast or? The no, North so North we North. found some close to the coast of Portugal. Others were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, literally in, like in, in the middle, middle, middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, the other ones were closer to um, the coast of the United States, uh, we because we went to Miami when we were there. Yeah. Um, but our this publication is we found microplastic particles in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Yes. Wow. Okay. So that means that um, probably for people living close to the coast or even not so close. We have a lot of the trade winds coming here and bringing probably winds also in the middle. Look, I, I, I say to my, 
my non-scientist friends, I said, look, you're breathing plastic. You have yes. eaten plastic. It's, yes, it it's was awful. found, there was, there was a study not, I think less than a year ago that found uh, plastic in rain. If you find plastic in rain, it is basically everywhere. Uh, yeah. right. So, everywhere. yeah. Yes. The thing that might save you of not breathing in the plastic is if they're big enough, then your own nostrils will protect you from it. But uh, if they de keep degrading and become in sizes that... Uh, well, if they're less than 10 microns, if it's in the mm. fine mode, uh, 2.5, they already right. get to your lungs. And if exactly. you're lower than one micron, you have them in your blood. Uh, exactly. And arteries. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that means that... Uh, but do you have you done any studies to to show if the microplastic is in human tissue and if you if we really breathe it in is this no 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 i'm not we're not focused question. we're not focused us us we haven't focused on that we don't focus on it's not our line of research and the microplastic in the air was mm -hmm. um it was like a cute baby that we couldn't let go and then we took care of the baby and then we said you grow up bye our line of research <laughs> is another one <laughs> And that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Oh, I have to I have to look into that. That's that's a very intriguing issue. And um, the Tara mission um, that is planned in front of the um, in front of the coast of Brazil. Mm -hmm. How? Uh, what will it investigate related to Brazil? Is there anything? So they're going um, to the. Um, Amazon River and to different rivers from Brazil and they're trying to understand the different microorganisms that exist within the uh, this the epipelagic zone that I talked about so the top part of the ocean mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're going down to 200 meters excuse me so they're trying to understand on one side the different microorganisms that exist within the, this water column um, they're trying to understand what is called marine snow. So the transports, if I remember right, well, I hope I'm not, make, I'm not making a mistake. Or this, no, the marine snow, not marine snow, sorry. Um, so different organisms. Um, so they're doing metagenomics and transcriptomics. So, um, so the organisms that are present, so from bacteria to algae and their interactions. And then there's a big part that they're trying to measure the amount of plastics that is in within the water. So there's also one part of the measurements that are only related to measuring uh, plastic um, off the coast. All right, that, that's really interesting. So wouldn't it be interesting maybe to combine the measurements over the sea with the coastal measurements or into the continent to see how far those plastic aerosol plastic containing aerosols go uh yes of course uh, but the thing is that here one thing is that we don't know where the pla if, if i'm talking a plastic aerosol i don't know mm. where it was produced i can have i can assume a production place based on the size and uh, say I study the back trajectories and see where it's coming from. I can assume that it came from that place, but. No, I'm, I'm thinking about forward trajectories to see where it's going and, and, and which regions it will impact where people will breathe it in or, or other organs. Uh, I think, <laughs> I, I mean, basically if you, if you live in a city, I think that you will be breathing plastic anyway. at some point at some point in your life for sure mm -hmm. um i mean the degradation of plastic is happening continuously and uh, you don't need the ocean for that you need the landfills that we that, is, that exist around the world as part of as part of right. uh, our society and then there will be some of it will be emitted they're so small no one can see it and you'll be breeding uh, breeding it yeah, that's true. Or eating it. I mean, there's. I saw studies that they found it in. Basically, there was one lady, I think, from San Diego. They went to the market, but I don't know how many fish. Did all her things to find plastic and and found plastic in all of them. 
Oh, I think I saw the study. Yes, yes, yes. So exactly. Yeah, it's also a bit discussion about the micro bits that are used in cosmetics and exactly how that contributes to it. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, it's really bad news actually, but uh, yeah, it's done. So <laughs> the plastic no. doesn't disappear so fast, and uh, it's no. it's very hard. And when we're talking about these. Uh, uh, micron sizes to uh, remove it, right? It's uh, yep. no sewage system or anything that will be able to to do that. So yeah, so it's uh, we got us uh, ourselves a really nice uh, global problem with the whole, the whole plastic uh, yep. tree, All right? Okay, Michelle. Um, I think uh, that's it here from the YouTube questions. And so far, the questions I had. Um, we still have time. Is there anything else you would like to, to comment on this topic or um, something that you felt you didn't have time for? Or... Ah, if, I, um, if there's still people there, I mean, I don't know yes. if they want to go back still into the... people. <laughs> I can show, yeah, I can show other results. I, I thought uh, normally I, I prepare seminars for 45 minutes. So I saw that I went, I was at 55 and that's why I, uh, yeah, stopped. No, but I can show, yeah. I can definitely show uh, other results. It won't be too long. Okay, great. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So let me go forward. You all saw this. I mean, I hope people will find it interesting. I, 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 I really enjoyed it. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so you see the slide that says Mesocosm 2018. Yes, yes, you see, this is the slide you see, I hope. Yes, okay, ah, in it. Okay, so, all right, so we, part of the study, thing so we did is we went to Norway and uh, we did what is called a mesocosm experiment, so a mid-size experiment, if you want to uh, call it differently. And what we did is we took the water from the fjords, okay, and we put it into the bags. These are bags that are about two meters in diameter and about five meters in depth. So you put the water from the fjord into the bags. We had seven bags. Three of them, we sealed them to study the aerosols that are being emitted. And four of them are, were for my bio biology colleagues that were studying uh, microbial and viral interaction within the ocean, okay? And then um, what we tried to do is we, we're specifically going there to study what is called an algae that is called Emiliana Huxley, okay? So this is um, an algae, it's a unicellular eukaryotic alga. Okay, now it is responsible for the largest algal blooms that, are, that cover thousands of kilometers in the North Atlantic and off the coast of Argentina. This is where we're going uh, right now in less than, that I'm going in less than 10 days to Argentina to study the algal bloom. And this is a picture of the algae. It's a beautiful uh, calcium carbonate shelves. It has this, uh, are called coccoliths. So they're from coccoliths and you have it and they surround the, uh, the cell. Okay, so we're starting how the lifetime of these blooms, uh, how they affect production of aerosols. Okay, now I want to, I put two pictures here. So this is day 10 of the experiment and then this is day 17. So you can see already the different colors of the, of the bags and how the algae um, was developing. To give you a better uh, idea, okay, so what I'm showing you now on the y-axis is the amount of calcified um, algae, or Emiliana Huxley, so EX, e we call them. And then on the x-axis, it is the, um, at the day of the experiments. So what I want you to see is that what we define as pre-bloom is um, did up to day nine. And then what you define, what we define as bloom is between day nine and day 18. And then the demise, meaning when the cell dies is after, after this period. Okay, so now to give you an idea how this looks. Hello. I want my... Yes. Yes, there we go. 
Okay. Oh. It just took a minute for the computer to react. Okay. So this is images of the scanning electron microscope, okay, of the water. And this is uh, the pre-bloom conditions, okay? So you see different, uh, they're called diatoms here. You see a little bit of Emiliana Huxley. All these white little things are different organisms that are present in the water. And this is before the bloom happened. When the bloom happened, this is what we found in the water. So you see all the, basically the explosion of the algae of Emiliana Huxley uh, within the water. And then when the, uh, the mice happened, you see this picture of where you see basically the coccoliths shedding out. Okay, so this is when the, the, uh, the algae begins to die. Okay, so this is what we're studying. Uh, in my specific case, I'm interested in what's being emitted to the atmosphere in all these different stages of, the, of this algae lifetime. Professor Asaf Vardi is, is interested in what's happening within the water. And then, okay, so, but that's, that's a completely different topic. Okay, so we sampled the air. Uh, again, now we used also a scanning mobility particle sizer. And here we use a, not an optical particle counter, but an aerodynamical particle counter. And we are also collecting for DNA sequencing, chemistry, morphology, and stuff. But today I only wanna show you what we found with the uh, scanning electron, uh, scanning electron, with the SMPS, so the, the smaller sizes and the big sizes. Okay, so on the right side, you have the graph that I already show you of the amount of uh, Emiliana Huxley cells, okay, separated by pre-bloom, bloom and demise area. And then on the left side, what I'm, I did is you have on the left axis, on the y axis, you have the aerosol concentration of particles between 200 nanometers and 20 microns. And then on the X axis, you have the hours of the day, 24 hour periods. And then I separated the, the data on the days of where there was the pre-bloom, the bloom and the demise. So first of all, we also see a dial cycle. This is a big, uh, happy, big surprise that we also have. That's one. Then the second is that we see that in pre-bloom conditions, the dial cycle is stronger. And as the bloom happens, we started to for it to, it starts to disappear. So when we have a much more creamier uh, water, it, in, it inhibits the production of aerosols. Okay, now we did, we're doing right now, I'm doing preliminary analysis of it. And I just wanna show you one more graph about it. And then we try to understand whether it comes from the solar radiation that we were measuring uh, during the experiment, we tried to see if the relationship with chlorophyll. So, and then we tried to see what the what is being secreted. So, these are called transparent uh, exopolymer particles. This is things that algae and bacteria secretes for a lot in this accumulation. They, we don't measure the secretion in an hourly basis. We measure it in an hour in one day basis. So, we cannot do uh, the, uh, full diurnal studies. Now, what you see here is each uh, x-axis corresponding to the different uh, variable. The y-axis is the aerosol concentration and the color scheme is the experiment day. Okay, so what we see is that the more transparent exopolymer particles are being produced, were produced as the uh, experiment uh, developed, and then we also had less particles. Okay, so this is the first result that we have. Basically, we have a daily cycle. We see that the more um, excretions from the algae there is, there's a, there's a decrease in the, um, in the way that the cycle behaves and the total amounts, okay? So this was attached to the previous talk to say that we didn't only find the dial cycle in the middle of the ocean, we also found it in quasi-controlled environments. So even giving more support that is something that happens in all of our oceans. Okay, so just as, uh, yeah, the conclusions of this part of the, of, of the, one of the other studies that we had. So clear dial cycle of the concentration of the aerosols that are emitted from the bags, and it's the highest in the pre-bloom conditions. The dial cycle disappears in the demise phase of the uh, Indiana Huxley bloom, 
And the larger the TEP concentrations, the lower the, the C-spray aerosol concentrations. So bottom line, there are two mechanisms occurring in parallel that affect the amount of aerosols that are being emitted, okay? Uh, and the rest is, this is something that you already saw, so the different um, publications. Uh, yeah, so that was just a few, I, 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 yeah, I'm happy to know that I had a little bit extra time to show it. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, sorry for putting you up to talk again. But no, it's I okay. You jumped some slides, and I was just curious what else you had. No, no, no. It's 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 great. It's great. <laughs> I hope it was interesting. It's like yes, you know. no, it is. You know, I was wondering if uh, it, well, it's probably too early, but to say how in a quantitative way, how uh, much are, is the aerosol uh, formation over the ocean driven by algae or bacteria? So is, is there any quantitative assessment? So how, my, how much aerosol would we have if it was, if we had uh, just salty water without uh, bacteria interacting or algae? So from the results that we have, from the uh, expedition, um, which is that natural environment, that's not uh, a bag covered with something bubbling artificially. We had an average of 2.6 more aerosols during the day than during the night. So you can say in a way that that is the influence of the, uh, if, again, if uh, we're correct, that will be the influence of the bacteria. A prox uh, plus minus with its error bars, of course. So that would mean that maybe two thirds of all aerosols uh, production that are produced are related to... I don't know if two thirds. I mean, we will have to take into account, and this is something that I don't have on the top of my head. Mm -hmm. You have to take into account the influence of the wind speed and the influence of sea surface temperature. Right, right. right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, very, very important discovery to uh, to get also our budgets right. So as I work with exactly. our chemistry and uh, we need the inventories, this is a crucial information <laughs> from the natural aerosols. So yes, should go into the uh, uh, your ocean emission uh, modeling. Yes. Uh, equations, I guess, and when we know more about the numbers. Very nice. Okay, Michelle, then thank you once more. <laughs> very, very You're welcome. Much. It was really exciting and to get a glimpse of, uh, of this area so we don't have too many people working on that. Uh, and uh, that's really fantastic. Thank you very much again. And also sorry for our format with the YouTube, but the good thing no. is and still watch it afterwards. <laughs> yes, thank you. And, uh, and if um, students and who are interested who couldn't maybe assist now, they can watch it yeah. later. So. Yes, and also like whoever has a question that appears to them later, I please email me. They can ask uh, you from my email. Uh, you can email me in Spanish, Portuguese, uh, English. That it's okay. And yeah, like please, like students and. Of course, other professors, and I'm more than happy to to sh keep sharing, and uh, and for students also that that are interested, um, very happy to answer your your questions. Perfect, Michelle. That's great. It's uh, especially for the students. It's a good yeah. way to know that they can just ask in Portuguese and that you will. Understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. Don't don't worry. Like I uh, I I understand it. I cannot talk it and I don't talk it because I, I was told that I sound like a little baby when I tried to talk Portuguese. So I decided to only say, okay, I understand and that's it. <laughs> uh, I guess most Brazilians can understand uh, Spanish if you don't speak yeah, too fast. <laughs> exactly, yes. Right. Okay, Michelle, then thank you very much. Uh, You're very welcome, thank you. Uh, when you have your next nature science paper, maybe we'll have you back for uh, <laughs> I, I, ho I hope you'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. then have okay. a nice remaining Wednesday. Thank you, Easter, you too. And uh, 